think we're still going to have people joining in it's quite early. Um, we're talk going to talk about uh, designing digital experiences for inclusion. Uh, over the last couple of days, we've been talking a lot about um, how we can build, uh, you know, the amazing digital experiences that we can build in Drupal. And what we're going to talk today about, why is it important to bring inclusivity into your uh, digital experiences and the benefits and how exactly can you start doing that? So quick uh, look at the agenda for today. We're going to do some introductions. Uh, this is going to be a very interactive session, so just heads up on that. Uh, we're going to look at what is an inclusive digital experience. What do we mean when we say digital? What, what is it that characterizes an uh, inclusive digital experience? We're going to also look at some of the pillars of inclusive design. So if you were to uh, bring inclusivity into your digital experience that you're building in your applications, what is it that you need to, how is it that you can do that? We're going to look very briefly also at what is a situational versus a permanent exclusion. Uh, and then also a very, very frequently asked, dis uh, discussed topic about do I do inclusion or do I design for accessibility? So we're going to look at what are really the differences between the two. And then we're going to wrap up the session uh, with, how, uh, with some of our learnings when we designed an inclusive digital experience using Drupal for one of our clients. Um, quick introduction on myself. I'm Arunama. I'm a product senior product manager with uh, Shijin Technologies. Um, I'm I co I like to call myself a product solutionist because product manager has a certain image attached to it. I'm also a storyteller and a published author of fiction, so I love writing and telling stories. And we're going to bring that element into um, our um, session today as well. Uh, three things that I'm passionate about: I'm passionate about storytelling. I'm passionate about. Uh, uh, product design and uh, sustainability. Some of you might have heard the session I was in yesterday on sustainability as well. And also learning for, for all. When we say learning, uh, we, we talk about e-learning, digital learning. And I like to say that you know doing that for everyone, for again, talking about inclusion there. So that's me. And those are my handles in case you want to reach out to me later on. So. Um, yeah, disclaimer, there will be some, uh, you know, interaction, find a neighbor, make sure you're sitting with a neighbor because there will be some interaction in this session with your neighbors. Um, and we're gonna, uh, it's a small group, so I don't know how much walking around we're going to do because we're all pretty sitting pretty close by, but there might be some moving around. Okay, um, why is it that we're talking of inclusion? Why am I talking of inclusion? Why did I pick this topic here today? So, like I said, one of my alter egos is that of a storyteller. And as a storyteller in the offline world, we interact with a very diverse um, range of people, very diverse kind of audiences when we tell stories. Um, I have some pictures here from some of my fellow storytellers. And um, uh, these, I mean, I've just put the picture, uh, uh, you know, you can see their names in the, um, uh, you know, in the credits. This is, uh, this is Rituparna talking, uh, you know, doing a session, poster session, uh, with the uh, students of a deaf school, right? Now, just think, students of a deaf school, and she did a storyteller. She, uh, she did a storytelling session with them. She doesn't know the sign language, but she did it, right? Um, this is uh, Shalini. She's doing a session with uh, kids from uh, a rural area, a school in a rural area in India, and um, then there is, again, I think that's Ritu again, doing a session with, um, uh, with autistic kids in um, uh, Nagaland. It's one of the states in India. And then we have, uh, again, I think this is Charlie doing uh, another session uh, as part of the Pratham. Um, so there's, a, there's an enterprise in uh, that is called Pratham uh, Books in India. Um, and they do, like, they go to all kinds of remote corners of country doing storytelling story sessions. Why am I talking of this? Um, one of the things that we notice is when we are sitting in an offline um, in an offline space, we're very much inclusive, and uh, we, you know we interact. Even this DrupalCon, we've got like hundreds of people here, right? And they come from all kinds of background. So in the offline world, we're very inclusive. Why why is it that when we translate that to the digital world, there is a gap? And what is it that now we need to do 
to translate this inclusivity that we have in the offline world into the digital world, which is what um, I'm passionate about, and that's why this session. Um, that, by the way, is Indian Varli art, um, which we sort of morphed into inclusion. We're going to do a quick icebreaker. Okay, um, I've been talking a lot. So um, everybody, I think, has a phone or a notebook or something, right? Let's try and identify. How will you identify yourself, right? And I'll give you some markers to help you do that, right? Um, it could be your age, gender, your family status, your occupation. And I want some uh, one volunteer to speak up. Let, let me, uh, I'll just give you an example. Like, for instance, I'm a, I'm a 40 year old female um, identifying myself with the pronoun she, her, uh, married with a kid, uh, working in the IT industry as a product manager. So that's me. That's my identity. Any volunteer for their identity? No volunteers. OK, cool. Um, I'm a 24-year-old uh, male. I identify as a TM. Um, I'm uh, just single, and I uh, started as a junior front-end developer recently. Awesome. So that's, that's, one, uh, that's one identity we got here. And I'm going to come to you, uh, the gentleman in the next row. Let me add some more markers. Another volunteer. Hi, uh, I'm a 23-year-old year old man. I indeed use pronouns he, him. Uh, I'm married with an adopted child. Uh, my child is uh, born black African. Uh, I work uh, in the IT sector and I help my wife business, so I'm a IT worker and entrepreneur in a way. I have a university background. Uh, I'm Finnish, so I'm from a small country. And uh, I do a lot of things with dogs and also do with Japanese uh, sports. That's very interesting. So you see that we added another layer to um, our identities when we spoke of this. And we can go on this way, right? We could add our abilities uh, into our identity. We could add any addictions. We could add our religion, our political affiliations. And, and this is a huge list, right? How you identify yourself is a huge list. It could, it could go on, right? Why did, wh what have we done here? Um, I know I've, I mean, two people have spoken, but I'm hoping the others have thought about their identities as well. And if you do that, what you'll realize is even within this small group, we are a very diverse audience, right? And when we talk of inclusion and digital experiences, this identity mapping is a very crucial or a key element of designing a digital experience. Um, really, an inclusive design, what is it? It's one that addresses the needs of an individual, of, of all individuals from very diverse identities, right? So we have a gentleman from... Uh, uh, who's Finnish and who has who's interest in Japanese sports? We've got somebody who is interested, um, uh, whose um, whose interest may be something totally different and maybe coming from a very different background, right? So when we talk about uh, designing here, we're talking about the three key elements that we always keep in mind when we are uh, designing for such a diverse audience. Designing with empathy—that's the most crucial element. Empathy is the most crucial element for any product manager, and this is something that we guys often quote, right? A product manager is a mix of two things, empathy and a lot of data, right? That's like, that characterizes, and a little bit of intuition, of course. Um, so what do we mean by designing with empathy? So an inclusive digital experience that is designed with empathy understands and empathizes with a diverse range of lived experiences and backgrounds. So go beyond um, backgrounds, right? Not just where are your users coming from, but what are their lived experiences? What are their needs? What are their frustrations? What are their desires? What are their shortcomings? That's something we do extensively when we are designing any solution in the user research. When we do our user research and when we do our market research, that's something we really dive into very deeply. And why empathy? Because you need to understand that. Right, you, 
it's one thing hearing somebody, and we're going to see very interesting examples in, late, in later slides. Right? One thing is understanding that. The other is being able to pick up the key nuggets from that, put that into your solution. The second thing, um, uh, you know, when, uh, when we look at designing here is co-designing with people. We are we what we should be looking at is building digital experiences not for people but with them, right? That's that's like the heart of co-designing. And it's it's very interesting when you start co-designing your solution with people, there will be so many facets that you will start thinking of which probably never came to your mind earlier, right? And again, we're going to see examples of that and we're going to probably even do some of them, right? Um, the third aspect is designing for diverse needs, right? Uh, so if we go back to the activity we did earlier, how are people identifying themselves? That is, you know, and, and what their needs could be, right? That's identifying the diverse needs and being able to design for them, designing the solution that fulfills, um, you know, their needs. And the more, the more diverse audiences that you look at, during your user research, when you're getting into designing your solution, um, the more you know, the more richer your experience, the DXP that you design will come out to be. So this sort of the three stages of the design and build process, right? Inspiration when you're looking and empathizing with your audiences, the ideation stage, where you are uh, basically thinking of brainstorming on. What are the needs that these people, uh, you know, that, that the people you're co-designing with will, uh, you know, those needs, how are you going to fulfill those needs via your application? And the third is obviously the build stage, when you're creating the solution. And um, unlike, you know, popular opinion, uh, design inclusion does not stop at the design process. It goes on into the build process. It goes on into how you're architecting your system. It goes on into what are the non-functional requirements you're going to look at, right? There is a very common term which is used for all of this, human-centered design. We've heard about it yesterday also um, in the session on ANU LMS. Um, and of course, it's a common term. What is human-centered design? It's, it's all of this. It's beyond just designing a, a graphic experience or a digital experience. It goes into designing of the entire solution for your users. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so basically, yeah, designing systems around people and not people around systems. Uh, very, very popular quote by Don Norman. Okay, quick activity. Uh, just making sure nobody's sleeping. Is this inclusive? Oh, what is this? Sorry, what is this? I, 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 I did an exclusion just now. Everybody knows what this is? Anybody who does not know what this is? It's okay, it's a small group, you can say no. <laughs> okay, this is the WhatsApp smiley set. Is this inclusive? Yes, no, no, okay. What about this? Is this? No, why not? Uh, stereotypes. stereotypes, okay. What about if I say that now, the and, and this is like the very old version, by the way, of the WhatsApp smileys. This is the newer version. And what now you do have is being able to select your color tones, being able to select something that represents you, right? So partially inclusive, a step closer. And now what they have is even closer in a way, but they're still getting there. So we can say this is totally exclusive. This is kind of inclusive and they still need to get closer to being more inclusive. Okay, moving on to the principles of uh, inclusive design. Um, and this is gonna be a quite a bit of theory, so I'm gonna try and make it as interesting as possible. When we talk of um, inclusive design, there are certain design challenges that we always look at, right? And when I say design challenges, again, not UI, UX, the entire solution. We have to under we, we assume uh, what we call as when we design when we sit down to design a solution. And I've been hearing sessions throughout yesterday, and uh, quite a few of them did this blunder. You design for what we call as the typical audience. Typical audience, you, me, people who know what 
these systems, how these systems work. Uh, they know how to read and write. There are some basic assumptions that we always make when we start creating an application, creating a system, creating a software for our users, right? But is that true for all audiences? So understanding what is the literacy level of your audience, both text and numerical, they can be different. Exploring what their connectivity challenges are. Understanding uh, which, which includes like, you know, do they, have, do they even have internet availability? What is the kind of speed they're sitting at? And we'll dive deeper into each of these. Understanding what is their digital literacy level, right? Respecting culture, identity, and ethics, right? Um, anticipating auditory, uh, visual, motor, and cognitive challenges. Anticipating onboarding challenges and understanding language barriers. We're going to go deeper into each of these design challenges and see uh, you know, what they mean and how we can bring them into our system. So we'll start with the first one. This is an actual uh, persona, actual user. We when, we, uh, when we were doing our user research for one of the applications we built, um, Alia is um, uh, she's a she's a 16-year-old girl living in um, uh, Iraq, and uh, here are some of her challenges when uh, we spoke to her about our application. Right, I'm able to use my mobile a little by following the shapes. I even search for difficult words using the sound search. These are actual statements. I can't read or write, but I know my mother's name by the shape, and I know how to call so I can talk to her. I wish I could find information in Turkmen, as it's my mother tongue. I can find information in Turkish, but it's not really the same. I want to learn. I feel shy asking others all the time. I do not have any sources. So Iraq, um, a border of Iraq, actually. And uh, she is um, what we call a, um, a refugee. She's living in a refugee camp, actually. These are her challenges. She does use uh, she does use uh, applications. By the way, she's a she's a big user of uh, Snapchat and TikTok. Okay, so it's not that she doesn't use applications, but here are her actual challenges, right? So this is this is the design challenge that we started with. What did what what are the design tools that we adopted in such a situation? Voice support, Drupal does it in a lovely manner, right? Speech to text and text to speech. Enabled via voice bots, voice search. Um, so when she gets into the application, she doesn't really need to write anything. She doesn't even need to be able to read too much there. She can just talk into it. Sounds and vibrations. Using familiar signals, such as the ringer sound, the buzzer sound, vibrations as signals. So OK, you know, here's your search results. Here, here's, here's what, uh, you know, you have a notification, right? Don't just write notification, buzz it, right? Using familiar symbols and illustrations for call to actions uh, to clearly indicate the intent. This was very critical for us when we were designing for uh, these people because uh, images and symbols is something they relate to. And again, we'll see how those images and symbols are not the ones that we understand really, right? So. They, uh, this is, these were some of the design tools we employed. Looking at low literacy levels may not always be on your radar, to be very honest, right? It depends on, you know, is your application, where are you designing your application for? So if you're designing your application for, let's say, use in just Czech Republic or just, let's say, North America, you may not want to do this. But um, question is, do you, are you sure you don't want to do this? Because are you sure you don't have people like Alia sitting in your uh, target uh, geography? The second design challenge, and this is important and interesting because I come from one of the countries in that red box. Um, the internet connection speeds, right? You can see that th 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 this is a graph. This is from uh, this. This data is from Jan 2022, and um, you'll see that uh, out of you know, I think we have 196 countries. 31 of them are lined here. Rest of the users sitting in those other 164 countries are either struggling to get into your application, access your application to its, you know, to its full utility, or probably are not even looking at the beautiful experiences you're building, right? So, so that's the audience we designed for. 
But are we looking at the other set of the audience, the one that lies on the other side of the red box, right? This is the second design challenge, which as, as product designers, as developers, it's critical for us to look at this. And the solution to this will never lie in your UI UX, right? It might, a little bit, but this, this particular thing can, is heavily handled by how you develop your application. So some of the design tools that we uh, did here, we offered offline support. We allowed them to download their content, access it anywhere, and once they went online, which used to be, you know, which, which could be when they get into, let's say, for instance, we in India, when we, when, we're in a, when we get back home, we have a high speed internet. So we go back and sync our activities, right? Um, there are people who may not have Wi-Fi at home, so you know, they might go to a community center, or you know, if you're talking of further countries who have very low internet bandwidths. Warnings and errors. This, of course, is something that we handle from a design side. Making sure the user's alerted, right? Oftentimes, you've got like the wheel going, 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 and you're just wondering what's happening, what do I do? And then, you know, all the data you saved, it's, it's just gone. The form you filled is gone, right? Making sure that you're capturing, catching that lost internet connectivity in time, showing the user the right error message, the right warning saying, okay, you know, here, th there's one app in India that does it beautifully. They'll give you a warning saying, you know, you're in a low internet zone. Don't do this activity, don't place your order. Uh, don't start a bank transaction, right? So that's warning and errors. And again, something that's more deeply technical uh, is more done from, let's say, the development side than from a UIOX side. The third design challenge, and I know, I don't know why that icon is floating there. Sorry about that, but just look at the image on the left. Low digital literacy is the third design challenge, and anybody who wants to take a shot at What's wrong with this? This is from a, uh, this is from a shopping uh, application in India. And anybody wants to take a guess at why is this wrong? Yeah. Just small to tap, that's interesting. Okay, very good. Anything else? Yeah, okay, close, very good. Anything, any other guesses? Uh, awesome, yes, very good. These are, all three of them are actually very correct points. One, use of icons which are not recognized. Most users, apart from let's say the top, uh, you know, the high internet connectivity countries, they'll mostly be sitting on Android phones. So Google provides this entire set of material icons rec which Android phones use, and they're internationally, most people recognize those icons. So if you Pick up an icon outside of the material library. Pick up an icon which does not even, I mean, that looks like a bag or I don't know what to me. If, I'm, if, I don't, if I've never accessed an application, I don't know what that icon looks like. Second thing, very valid point. Some of these icons, a, a person who has never used an application will not even know what this icon is. And again, so all, all valid points. And one more point which I want to add here. What, about, what do you feel about the busyness of this uh, page? There's just so much to do. For somebody who's a first time internet user, this experience is overwhelming. I just don't know what do I click. Do I click here? Do I go there? Do I go there? I, as a, you know, if, if, if put yourself in the shoes, the empathy part, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who has, who's, used in, who's using internet for the first time. What, do we, what, what will go through their head here, right? I don't know what to do. And what is the result of that? They just give up. Too, too confusing, I don't know, I don't want to use it, right? And this, we've seen this happening, right? We, 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 when we created the first prototype of the uh, application for these user, for this, um, for this client, when we gave it, I mean, obviously, we, were, we, we, we made that pitfall of designing for the typical customer, we gave it to them, it was a learning site. They, they rejected it so badly, we came back and we were like, we were holding our heads and, oh, why did we spend like the two last two weeks sitting and designing this? They didn't, even, they didn't even look at it. They're like, we don't understand it. It's, it's just too busy. I don't know what to do in this application. So that's, this is precisely what happens. So when you're looking for uh, designing for um, low digital literacy, these are some of the things that you have to keep in mind. You have to make sure that your layouts and iconography, it's minimalist, it's uncluttered, right? 
at most three call to actions per fold. And again, Material does an awesome job of providing like guidelines for what kind of layouts to use, uh, what kind of iconography. The second thing is detailed messages. Again, being sh making sure that you're placing alerts, confirmations, acknowledgement messages. Give them messages left, right, and center. It helps them. For somebody like us who use internet day in, day out, it might be a little um, you know, irritating to have so many confirmations. But your confirmations can be very subtly placed and uh, even system generated at times just to make sure that your users are actually being able to uh, you know, get confirmation. They, it gives them that trust that, yeah, I'm, I'm interacting with an application and it's, it's doing the right thing for me. Um, the other thing that that does is also reduce the possibility of mistakes, right? If they're going in a wrong path, they're not taking the happy path that you want them to take, just give them the warning, right, that, you know, you're doing something wrong. Okay, again, quick activity. How many of you guys see two numbers in these circles? Everybody? Great. I didn't see one hand raised. How many of you see a uh, six in one of these numbers? Okay. How many of you see a five? Great. Uh, do you see a five in the left or the right? Okay. You don't see a five? Okay. Awesome. This is, I mean, not, that's not awesome, but I'm glad to have somebody because <laughs> Because I've had audiences when I did this, everybody could see everything and then it got boring. <laughs> but um, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, what is the color of the flowers? How many of you see blue flowers here? How many of you see lavender flowers here? Lavender or purple, right? This goes a little deeper, right? So this, most people who will, uh, most people will see, will not be able to see the five over here that almost 50% of the population saw lavender, the, 50, the rest 50 saw blue here, right? So what is this? This is, these are challenges with being able, so are you able, if you're going to use these colors on your application, and this is again a little UI UX centric, right? Half the people it, are not going to be able to read it. They won't be able to make, make out what, what you put there. So here are the design tools that we use, and yeah, this was a big challenge because we saw 50% blue and lavender. So some of the design tools that we used uh, to make sure, of course, I mean, I just put those for the AV part of it, but then there were there are often challenges you'll come across with uh, audio uh, limitations, right? You might have people who have some motor limitations, right? Especially when you're looking at designing for um, smaller age groups, right? Um, Learning applications, very important uh, design challenge to solve for learning applications, cognitive and motor limitations. What were the design? What are the design tools you can use? Right, you can use transcriptions and narrations. Right, enabling the automated narration tools and transcription service. Again, something that Drupal does amazing. Great, comp uh, great modules available to do transcriptions and narrations. Um, readability and interaction. Right, making sure your colors, your typography, the screen mode. Uh, you brought up the point of you know the uh, the icons being too small. Right, making sure whatever elements, every element on your screen has its place, is important to that page, is going to load correctly and for all the right audiences. Making sure it is clickable and readable. Right, using standard typographies again is extremely important. A lot of the times you will come up across applications which is using things like, you know, very beautiful fonts, but hardly readable. So that's the next design challenge. And then we come to the final design challenge of uh, which sort of bundles around all the ones that we have spoken of so far. Uh, the diverse culture, the diverse identities and ethics. And again, uh, kind of from the client we work for, uh, we did a color study which was very interesting because um, the application was being designed for uh, girls, young girls. And uh, we said, okay, you know, let's, let's pick up something that's nice, cheerful, happy colors. We picked up four or five colors, uh, did a color study around it, and uh, sent back samples to, um, to, you know, to, the, uh, to the user research team to go through with all the girls. 
Uh, what we found is, and when we did this color study, we studied about 12 different colors, uh, primary and secondary colors. And we found like every color has a different connotation in different places of the world, right? And we eventually hence zeroed down to blue and pink, right? Pink was rejected, by the way, by all the girls. They said, we don't want pink. Surprising, we all think that pink is something that girls will like, but they did not. So we settled on blue there. Uh, probably one of the reasons um, you see blue very frequently um, is because it's got positive connotations in almost every uh, region of the world, right? But yeah, I mean, doing these things, right? And this is again one of uh, you know one of the illustrations we used in the application. Um, again, because it was supposed to be like a support app, uh, we made we had to make sure that our illustrations uh, were capturing very diverse audiences because it was it was a refugee camp. It was a refugee population, and um, you know it had a mix of all kinds of people there. So again, uh, a design tool that you can use to solve this design challenge is meaningfulness. Making sure that your images and illustrations are designed in a way that the actual target audience can connect with it, not you or I. It has to be your target audience for the application that should be able to connect with it. It should evoke the right thought. It should not make them feel, um, you know, it should not uh, make, make them feel offended, right? Uh, one of the things that we, uh, you know, uh, we, we had, a, you, you see the specs on that girl's face. We added that in later. When we first created this illustration, we didn't have specs on that girl. But then they, the, uh, the girls came back saying, you know, we feel that if you're wearing specs, you're, you know, you're intelligent and you, you, you're knowledgeable. So we want somebody with specs on the, uh, on the illustration. And then we added those specs in, uh, the spectacles in. Um, avoiding use of locally offensive colors, images, and signs. So that's, that's the another design challenge. And the design tool you can employ to sort of solve this. Some of the others, uh, especially when you're onboarding your people, uh, the, your users to the application, some of the other uh, onboarding challenges that you should think of, maybe you're not solving for them, but uh, understanding language barriers, exploring devices, screen sizes, and resolutions, understanding user security and privacy concerns, and ensuring consistency in content hierarchy. I'm not going to dive deeper into each of these, but um, you guys are mostly from uh, Drupal development backgrounds, so you know that the first three is something that Drupal does amazingly again. Um, it, it has multilingual support, supporting a large variety of languages, RTL, NTR, everything. Um, it also, you know, it fits very well to the different devices, screen sizes, and resolutions. Um, also, the security and privacy, and then ensuring the, uh, because it's a CMS, it ensures that the content hierarchy is always, uh, it's consistent. But yeah, I mean, if any of you want to t talk, discuss more about this with me, I'm, I'm available throughout the day here today. Finally, um, quick question. How many of you guys have said it, said this statement to one, you know, any of your users at least once in your life? I know I have. I know I have. Why did you make that error? It's, it's written in that user manual. Now you got that in the user manual. Didn't you read it? We all make this, I, I would say it's a mistake. I realized it much later. But as a developer, even I, I have said this statement multiple times. Didn't you read the manual? When I started designing, I realized that what we call error is usually bad communication or interaction. When people understand what has happened, what state the system is in, and what the most appropriate set of actions is, they can perform their activities more effectively. Right? Uh, this is, again, a quote from uh, Don Norman's book, Design of Everyday Things. Amazing book if anybody wants to get into really how product design is done. But yeah, I mean, this, this sort of sums up the essence of what we look at as a solution design, right? Oftentimes, we expect our users to behave, to interact with the system in a certain manner. And 99% of the times, they won't do that. And then they'll run into errors. They'll run into obstacles, roadblocks, which they can't solve, right? So this is where, um, and this has a very serious implication, actually, uh, is that when you're working with a diverse audience, or even, you know, we don't even have to go into the kind of diversity we were speaking of so far. 
just to think of you know your application being used by let's say a 60 year old right they get stuck with something what will they do oftentimes they will say they will not think this is a system failure they will not think okay why was an alert not given to me or why, why was i not told what to do or given a you know given a right hint or a tooltip in the app most of the times they say oh i don't know how to use technology right it's a common thing it's it's perceived as human failure whereas actually it is system failure and what is the adverse effect of that people will stop using it for especially the vulnerable population people who are old who people who are young people who have some kind of challenges right uh, or people who are maybe first time users they will think that oh i don't know technology and that's like a mental block they develop and this will often stop the user from returning to the experience uh, to the digital uh, experience that they were on i've spoken a lot and uh, i'm i'm hoping the audience is still awake so we're going to do a quick activity um, what i want you to do is and here's where your partner neighbor somebody around you comes in raise your uh, dominant hands if you're a right handed person your right hand left hand okay put that in your pocket or behind you okay uh, now take out your phones or if you have a notebook take out your notebook and uh, any note taking app on it pull that up write your name type your name on it okay let me know when you guys are done you can just maybe you're done okay very fast Excellent catch. Done. Okay. Now, um, pick up a neighbor. Some of you guys are sitting alone, but now exchange your name. Show your name to your uh, neighbor and uh, maybe exchange phone number or your LinkedIn IDs with them. So open either, let's say, the phone app, dialing app, or the LinkedIn app. Okay. <laughs> You can you can just share it via a text. Okay, share your uh, any identity. You could share your phone number. You could if if you if you don't want to give out your phone number or your let's say you could just share your LinkedIn ID. So open LinkedIn, and say you know share hit the share button, send it to the other person or send a connection request. We're making some connections as well in this session. Yeah, network a bit in the session. Making sure everybody's awake for the next 15 minutes. Okay. Done. Okay. I see some people have completed it. Okay, are we done? Some networking done? Great. Uh, how did the experience feel? Any volunteers? From this side this time. I, I think this, this section is very interactive. How did the experience feel? <coughs> Sorry? Inconvenient. Okay. Awkward. Yeah. Normal. Okay. Okay. You're the exception. And again, another uh, persona for our, if, if somebody was to do a user research, you're le you would be another persona because you can use both hands. That's amazing. Um, so we have any other experiences? How did you guys feel doing this? Slow. Sorry? Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. It's slow. It's, it's awkward, right? It feels unnatural. Right. What was this? Was this? None of you guys have really. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping, but none of you guys really have any kind of disability that way, right? Using your dominant hand. But does that mean you will always use your dominant hand? I think this gentleman you brought up a very nice point. How many of you have re registered your uh, non-dominant hand uh, fingerprints? Exclusion can. It does not always have to be permanent. When we design for audiences, and 
earlier in the session I spoke of a point where, where I said, you know, it's not always, it, if, if you're designing for, if you're building an application for, uh, uh, for inclusion, it does not always have to target people who are, um, you know, who have certain disabilities or who are always from, you know, a background that you're not familiar with, right? Exclusion can, of course, be permanent. Somebody with audiovisual, color blindness, cognitive, or motor limitations. It could be temporary, right? What you just had was a temporary um, um, limitation using your dominant hand. It could be a short-term injury, you could have a broken limb, you could have an ear infection. It could be situational, right? All of us who are parents probably here in this group or you know, who've got kids know, you know how it feels to have a toddler in one hand and then do the other, all the other work in one, with the other hand, right? So it could be situational, right? You could be driving and have to take a call, right? Um, you're trying to watch a video in a very noisy place, right? So it could be situational. So when we're designing or building something for inclusion, does not mean that you always have to go into researching an audience um, sitting in some remote place of the world. It is right here in this room, right? So that's where, um, you know, when you're, when you're building your application, you have to make sure that uh, you're designing for all kinds of exclusion, not just permanent exclusions, but also situational or temporary. So building a digital experience for inclusion benefits everyone. It's not just somebody you've never met. So question of inclusivity versus accessibility. I know there are a couple of more sessions around this to, uh, today. So I'm gonna go like breeze through this. When we talk of inclusion, including and learning from people with a diverse range of experiences and needs when you are designing the experience, right? When you're looking at what should my architecture look like? What should my UI UX look like? What kind of error handling do I need? I'm designing it still. I do not have the concept of a typical customer when I'm designing for inclusivity. Accessibility on the other hand is a digital experience that enables people with diverse needs to use it. It has a very clear definition. If you go and look at the WCAG standards, there's a very clear definition of what your typical customer for accessibility will look like, somebody with certain limitations. So in a way you could say, uh, designing for inclusivity is the method. An accessible design is the outcome of that method, right? In a way also, accessibility is like a subset. When you design for inclusion, most of the times, and we saw that in the design challenges, most of the times accessibility will get covered in it. So accessibility doesn't necessarily take into account different ideas, cultures, or perspectives. It focuses more on adapting the con content to support different modes of interaction and engagement, hence a part of the outcome. Last part of the session, what we learned while we were implementing inclusive DXP with Drupal, some of the handles out of Drupal that we uh, leverage, and amazingly, because uh, it's, it's so convenient to actually build an inclusive design in Drupal. Uh, virtual personal guide, we've got the onboarding modules available with us, so when, we, uh, when users access the site, they were greeted with Anya. Anya is a name that's virtually uh, there in almost all languages, so we, we could find this name with a very positive meaning in almost 86 different languages, um, which means graceful in most of them. So Anya was a virtual personal assistant, their guide throughout the site. She would help them onboard, provide them recommendations, and help the user navigate via prompts. Uh, voice assistants, uh, we did, uh, we did uh, an integration uh, with Google Voice Assistants as well. Uh, but because not all languages and dialects were supported, there was some which was built custom. So instead of a conventional search page um, or you know a content listing page, users were first presented with a you know uh, with a box where they could like a, like a search box where they could speak questions into the search box and they get directly to the contents instead of having to browse through content or you know typing in a search. So Anya enabled uh, users to find the relevant content via speech and voice search based on their interests. Offline support, again, um, users could download content to view f offline. Um, we did a PWA, so their activities offline were stored um, and synced once they went online, uh, when they were in a better bandwidth zone. Um, we did localized microsites, 
So Drupal multi-site architecture was adopted. We built multiple microsites based on the core main site. Uh, the code base was kept the same, uh, but they had different themes and different modules for each microsite uh, based on the geography that it would be uh, shown in. And uh, some parts of the database were also uh, different uh, to deliver the localized versions of the site. Low bandwidths, uh, again, we, had, we have the Drupal AMP module that we used, making sure that even people in 2G, 3G connections could access at least the most key pages of the site. Uh, they can work on low bandwidths, and uh, automatically all uh, the layouts were generated um, in uh, AMP with, uh, with you know, literally uh, minim zero effort. Uh, we were using Drupal 9. Uh, it was multilingual, supporting almost all languages. Um, and it was mobile first, PWA, because none of our audience segment had uh, almost like it was hardly 10, 12 percent of our audience segment that really had an access to a laptop um, and uh, or a desktop. Uh, finally, wrapping up with the question, why should I invest on designing an inclusive digital experience? Uh, I know that many of us, this question came up uh, a couple of times uh, yesterday as well. Um, if, if you guys were on, the ta uh, on Tavi's uh, keynote as well, you know, do I design, how many, uh, how, how, what level of inclusivity do I need to go to? Uh, do I need to like pick up all the diversity that I can? Not really, it depends, uh, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% uh, of your users, the 20% is for us, when we design, the 20% is always a nice to have. We follow Agile, the 80% is a must have, uh, the 20% is a nice to have. We try and break down that 20%'s requirements into uh, you know, as, as uh, granular as we can so that we can pull it into our requirement set that we implement. Why should I invest? Uh, the next three billion customers, these are your unconnected populations, people who are sitting on either no internet or very low internet. This is your literacy rate uh, by region and gender, right? This is just an input. And what happens when you design for these people? You expand your consumer base in existing markets. Like we just saw, we have a very diverse, very uh, different audience, uh, you know, different identities sitting right here in this room, which has hardly 30 people in it, right? But you can expand to every single person sitting in your existing market. You can target new markets, and very important from a business perspective, you build trust in your brand. That's that's key critical uh, element to why you adopt an uh, inclusive digital experience, an uh, inclusive digital experience. And of course, because it's the right thing to do, right? It's unfair that you know we who are maybe privileged are able to use almost all applications. There are vast majorities who are not able to, right? And uh, if we look at ourselves as developers, we do want to make sure that what we are building gets out to as many people, uh, you know, as many people as possible. So it's just the right thing to do. Some resources that we have um, that we refer to when we were doing this uh, case study, uh, when we were doing this uh, project, <coughs> was the design kit from IDEO. Amazing uh, design kit. If, um, it's got like handy tools and everything. Best practice guide from Material and the uh, W3C's uh, uh, accessibility initiative. So with that, I wind up, and I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm right around here. Yes, maybe one question we'll take. Uh, one, one question, because we are actually out of time, but please use the microphone for the question we have next to you. Okay. Sorry, this is very simple. What is AMP? You mentioned AMP module. Accelerated mobile pages. That's like a very, in, I, to put it very simply, it's a very basic version of your page. Stripped down of all kinds of, uh, um, you know, uh, all elements that will consume a lot of bandwidth. Yeah, unfortunately, we're five minutes over, so we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you very much. That was fascinating. Thank, thank you. you so much.